The last 500 years have witnessed a phenomenal and unprecedented growth of human power. In 1500, there were about 500 million Homo sapiens worldwide. Today there are 7 billion. The total value of goods and services produced by humanity in 1500 is estimated at $250 billion in current currency. Today, it is close to $60 trillion. In 1500, humanity consumed about 13 billion calories a day. Today it consumes 1500 billion. The human population has increased 14-fold, production 240-fold and energy consumption 115-fold. Before 1522, no human being had circumnavigated the Earth until Ferdinand Magellan and his expedition made a 72,000 kilometers round the world trip. Jules Verne imagined that an adventurer could accomplish a world tour in 80 days. Today, any person of average income can make the world tour in just 48 hours. In 1674, the human eye saw a microorganism for the first time when Anton van Leeuwenhoek, through a microscope, observed all the tiny creatures that move in a simple drop of water. In the following decades several species of these microorganisms were discovered. We were able to identify several deadly diseases caused by them and eradicate them. American scientists saw the first atomic bomb explode in New Mexico. From then on they had the chance to change the course of history and put an end to it. In 1969, human beings landed on the moon. No other organism had ever left the Earth's atmosphere. This process is called the scientific revolution. Revolution because until then human beings doubted their ability to obtain new military and economic medical skills. Governments and other patrons allocated funds for education and scholarship, but the goals were to preserve existing capabilities and not acquire new knowledge. The typical pre-modern ruler gave money to priests, philosophers and poets in the hope that they would legitimize their government and maintain social order. He did not expect them to discover new medicines, invent new weapons, or stimulate economic growth. During the last five centuries, human beings have come to believe that by investing in scientific research they could increase their capacities. The more empirical evidence there was of the beneficial results of research, the more funding governments and wealthy people attributed to science. But where did this belief come from? What forged this relationship between science, politics, and economics? Harari's answer is that the basis of the scientific revolution is the discovery of ignorance. It was the discovery that human beings do not know everything that drove scientific research. The narrative of knowledge prior to the scientific revolution, spread by Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and Confucianism was that humanity already knew everything there was to know. The almighty gods and the wise men of the past embraced all knowledge which had been recorded in sacred scriptures. If a medieval peasant wanted to acquire some kind of knowledge he only needed to ask the local parish priest. If he wanted to acquire knowledge that had not been discovered, it was a sign that this knowledge was not relevant because the scriptures made no mention of this knowledge. At that time, those who spread the message that we did not know everything were persecuted or marginalized. Or they started a new tradition that said they themselves knew everything. An example is Muhammad, who accused the Arabs of living in ignorance of the divine truth. Then, he spread the message that he was the owner of all knowledge. Today's science openly admits ignorance about the most important issues. Today's biologists admit that they have not yet unraveled the secret of life and physicists admit that they do not know what caused the Big Bang. Scientists usually assume that no theory is 100% certain. Thus, truth is a weak test for knowledge. The real test is whether knowledge is useful or not. The theory that allows us to do new things is knowledge. Science has provided humanity with useful tools. Some are mental tools that allow us to calculate the mortality rate and economic growth. But the most important tools are technological tools. In fact, today the link between the two is so strong that people tend to confuse the two. The relationship between science and technology is relatively recent. Until the 17th century, science and technology were separate fields. It was then that Francis Bacon decided to unite the two concepts into one, which was considered a revolutionary idea. 
From then on the relationship between the two intensified, culminating in the 19th century. And even then, no ruler financed scientific research to obtain a more efficient and powerful army. Nor did any tycoon do the same to increase his profits. Occasionally, new technologies were developed, but by people with low level of education, through the method of trial and error, and not by scientific research. Take for example the manufacturers of wagons. The carts models were evolving, but were produced by carpenters who couldn't even read. In 1961, US President Dwight Eisenhower drew attention to the growing power of the military-industrial complex. But Eisenhower forgot to alert to the scientific factor of the equation, because today's wars are driven by science. It is the governments of the great powers that finance much of the world's scientific research, not always for good reasons. When the First World War developed into an endless trench warfare, the governments of the countries at war appealed to scientists to solve the problem. It was then that wonderful weapons began to come out of European laboratories, fighter planes, tanks, submarines, poison gas, machine guns and more effective bombs. In World War II the role of science was even greater. By the end of 1944, Germany was clearly losing the war. Yet the Germans continued to fight, partly because they believed in the emergence of miracle weapons thought to alter the course of the conflict, V-2 missiles and jet aircraft. Meanwhile, the Americans were developing the first atomic bomb through the so-called Manhattan Project. By 1945, Germany had already surrendered, but Japan continued to fight, promising to do so until there were no soldiers left. With his new bomb at his disposal, President Harry Truman decided to use it against Japan. Two and not one were eventually used, and Japan surrendered unconditionally. Knowledge is power. Science can also contribute to better defense systems. The US Department of Defense believes that the solution to terrorism is not political. It believes that just spending a few million more on nanotechnology and the United States could send bionic spy flies to all the Al-Qaeda and ISIS caves and hiding places. But this obsession with military technology is quite recent. Until the 19th century, most military revolutions were due to organizational rather than technological changes. Most empires did not rise due to technological superiority, nor were sovereigns interested in them. The Roman Empire is a good example to illustrate this point of view. It was the best army of its time, but it was no better in technological terms than Carthage Macedonia or the Seleucid Empire. Its superiority was based on efficient organization, discipline and the number of soldiers in reserve. If we compare this example with modern times the rules change. Napoleon's army, formed by musketeers, cavalry and light cannons would have no chance against an army with tanks, fighters, and machine guns. In ancient China the emperor and the philosophers did not believe in investing in scientific research either. The most important military invention of the time was gunpowder. However, as far as we know gunpowder was invented by accident. And yet China did not become a global military power because it had this advantage. Only 600 years later gunpowder was used for military purposes on the battlefields. So why did it take so long for this advance to materialize? Because it came at a time when neither rulers nor academics believed that a technological advance would make them more powerful. That was enough so that there would be no incentive or investment for more scientific advances to emerge. We live in a technological and scientific age. Many believe that science has the answer to many of our problems. But science is not at a higher moral level than all the rest of humanity. Like other aspects of life in society, it is involved in political, economic and religious interests. Science is a very expensive activity. A biologist who wants to study the human immune system needs a laboratory, test tubes, advanced microscopes, assistants, electricians, etc. An archaeologist needs excavation materials, machines, assistants, all this costs money. During the last 500 years, science has benefited a lot from financial aid from governments, companies, private foundations and others to promote scientific advancement. If there had been no funding for geographical, zoological, and botanical research, Darwin would probably have no empirical evidence on which to base his theory of evolutionism. 
one might think that this money supply is purely altruistic, but behind it is often a political or economic objective. For example, in the 16th century, kings and bankers provided many resources to encourage geographical exploitation around the world. This was because they assumed that this knowledge would bring them new land to dominate or to create a new commercial network. In the 1940s, the United States and the Soviet Union channeled immense resources into nuclear research, which would allow them to develop nuclear weapons and thus win wars more easily. It can be said that, although it is the scientists who work directly on the development of new knowledge, it is rarely they who dictate the course of science. Even if one wanted to finance a pure science, free of economic or political interests, this might be impossible. After all, resources are limited, so we have to ask, what is the priority? These are not scientific questions. Science only seeks to know what exists in the world, not what the future should be. Only religions and ideologies seek these answers. Imagine two scientists and a sum of 1 million euros available. One wants to study an infectious disease that affects cows' udders, causing a 10% drop in milk production. The other wants to find out if cows suffer mental problems when they are separated from their young. If it is impossible to finance both projects, which one should be supported? There is no scientific answer to this, only an economic or political or religious answer. In today's world, the first scientist is more likely to receive funding, not because his research is scientifically more important than analyzing cows' mental problems, but because the dairy industry would benefit from it. For example, from a merely scientific point of view, it is not clear what should be done with a growing understanding of genetics. Should we use it to cure cancer, develop a race of superhumans or raise dairy cows with giant udders? A liberal government, a communist government, a Nazi government and a company would use the same discovery to achieve completely different goals without there being a scientific reason to prefer one over the others. In short, scientific research can only flourish when combined with a religion or ideology. Ideology justifies the costs of research. In return, ideology influences the scientific agenda and determines what to do with its findings. As such, to understand how humanity arrived at the moon and not at any other alternative destination, it is not enough to study the advances of physicists, biologists or sociologists. We have to take into account the ideological, political, and economic forces that have shaped physics, biology, and sociology, pushing them in certain directions while neglecting others. So, do you agree with Yuval Harari's ideas? Write your opinion in the comments. If you found this video interesting, please share it with others.